image of when the Byerly building collapsed in 1915. On the 50th anniversary of the day Abraham Lincoln was shot, the building is creaking and making noises for months. John Davis hires some architectures to try to shore up the building and save it. Unfortunately, they aren't able to save it. It collapses one day. At first, they thought a small child was killed, but luckily nobody was, nobody was injured seriously in this collapse. Take it away, Eric. So, yeah, thank you, thank you. So the second half is going to be more uh, photos and some of, some of the mapping things. Um, one of our challenges when we were researching this and finding out where the photo was actually taken, we didn't want to fall into the same trap that the, the Rosenstock uh, building fell into. In other words, the Byerly building now, that since uh, Frederick was built in 1915, but we wanted to be absolutely certain that that was the building that's being referenced with all these uh, property deeds, newspaper articles, and, and, and references to the, uh, the Frederick Cox Savings Institution. So there's a lot of cross checks we need to do to make sure that we didn't fall into that same trap as well. So for example, uh, you know, uh, looking at the map over here, um, we now know that the Byerly Studio is here, and we now know that Frederick Town Savings Institution is here. But before addressing, uh, incidentally, we found out that uh, your typical house number addressing came about right at the end of the Civil War. The first address that we see in Frederick, Maryland, is in late 1864. By 65, they start coming strong, and by 66 and 67, we see a lot more house numbers. But back then, in, in the newspapers, we didn't have house numbers to cross-reference to where things were. So we had to use property deeds. Um, <coughs> hold on, technical glitch over there. Yeah, so it's very interesting in all these advertisements that we looked at before, none of them had a house number. These ads just say, you know, across the street from Gibson to your shoe store or, you know, next to the savings institution. Here you go. It's all... Well, yeah, it, you can sort of see here um, what I was talking about. Because what we needed to do is cross-reference all these um, textual descriptions um, and, and relationships to stores and banks and things like that. Um, so, yeah, here's, here's a bigger map of So we, we came into this uh, map, by the way, shows that, by the way, also, this is heading north. Um, we turned it sideways so that we could see uh, more real estate on the map here. And this is an 1887 map, Sanborn Sanborn map. And this has addressing. But back then, we didn't have addressing. So what we needed to do was just use plats, uh, newspaper articles, and, and deeds to help us sequence where everything was, who owned what, um, before we got too far along. Incidentally, this, this unit here is Byerly's building. Uh, this is uh, uh, Rosenstock's building. Over here is the Savings Institution. And uh, these two buildings here are the buildings that you see in the background of the Confederate photo with the, the troops sitting in. Incidentally, this, this photo is taken from right here, where Colonial Jewelers is right now, looking diagonal across the street. This building is the Rosenstock building that everybody thinks the photo was taken in front of. And if that's the case, the camera operator would have had to go here, shooting this way so that you can see the sign. Let me see. This is a post-war photo from about the 18, late 1890s. So here's, here's the sign over here on this other board. If Rosenstock had a store either on the corner or in this building, the sign would have stuck out and the photographer would have captured it, probably from that building right there. But this is a false location. We'll just be yeah, right, right, right. Because this is all post-war. The, the other uh, challenge that we had was possibly he had a sign on this location heading north on Market, and the photographer was up in here and shooting the sign down there. So we had a lot of challenges. My initial uh, goal when we set out to do this was just to simply do one of those then and now photos. That's all I wanted to do. I mean, I was convinced it was on Patrick just like everyone else. But when we got there, and we started taking measurements, started lining things up, 
things didn't fit, and that's where Paul uh, spent many hours at the library plowing through, uh, you know, the, the New microfilm, microfilm. Looking, yeah. looking for what we found, which was the Holy Grail of uh, Rosenstock opening his store across from the city, uh, the Fredericktown Savings Institution. This is some of the detail that we went into. This is a this is the uh, property, pro property deed uh, for the Fredericktown Savings Institution from 1850, I think. Yeah. yeah. And this is a plat representing the same thing. This um, this plat, by the way. Let's see here. Is uh, right here. This uh, the, one of the problems with the Savings Town Institution, by the way, that we researched. The plat is actually. Three, it had three different subdivisions to it. So when we went to place the photographer and the photo and line everything up, it was really challenging for us because it was one property, but it had three buildings on it. So we didn't know for sure which of these three buildings was the, saving, uh, the Frederick County Savings Institution. And we were able to figure it out. Um, I don't know how much of you guys know about deeds, but there's a, a term called meets and bounds. And it describes property boundaries with, with coordinates and distances and things like that. It's not a map, it's words saying you need to go 57 feet in the southeast direction to a corner lot, to a fence post, and then it just gives all these things. So what we did is we, we this here is the meets and bounds for the Fredericktown Savings Institution property. Of the three different units. Of the three different units. And then we were able to take uh, historical pictures like the one that you see here, which was probably taken by Byerly. This is a lithograph here. Made from possibly the original daguerreotype. Yeah, glass plate or something. So we, what we were able to find out was that the, um, also back here, that this uh, actual Fredericktown Savings Institution was in this property here. Uh, the Byerly building was here. And, and Rosenstock was right there. So. And just just some random photos here. That this is a picture of the Fredericktown Savings Institution um, taken the, out of the Byerly building. You made eighteen eighties image. Yep, you can see that it's probably taken out of the third floor of the Byerly building. Um, this uh, is the Examiner building. Um, which, About eighteen eighty three summer. Thank you. Yes. Still see the wooden sign, and the wooden sign lasted probably until uh, late. 1890s, early 1900s, it was still there in the it, same exact position. And this is the building that you think that Byerly flourished to occupy um, in, in 1840. Uh, mm -hmm. This, by the way, is, is the back of that examiner building showing the skylights. And we think they're original, but we don't know for sure, uh, of, of Byerly's original studio. So um, some of the interesting things that helped us um, figure out what was going on in, in the photo. The famous Confederate photo, off to the left. Was what we termed is, is the forensics of the photo. We started looking at the photo, and aside from the obvious things that were in it, the Rosenstock sign and the troops, we found, we started looking, and we started finding all these little tiny kind of clues. And I'm going to go through each of those a little bit and describe them and how we feel that they're important to the photo. Here we are right here with uh, a lot of these clues. For example, um, here in the corner is what appears to be what we might think of today as a notary seal. It, it's a, a circular uh, sunburst, you know, sunburst looking kind of stamp. At first, I thought that was a straw hat for sale or something mm -hmm. hanging underneath the Rosenstock stuff, right? But no, it turns out it's, a, it's, a, it's some type of stamp that was put on. Um, and if we look at the... Uh, you look at the original thing right here. Uh, see, you can see here. This is Edmiston's signature from uh, 19 uh, around 1930, and the, the, the original actually, paper print must have had that seal on. Right, the original paper print that Byerly uh, developed and printed had that seal on it somehow. We don't know who put it on, and whether it was Albert Brown or, or Benjamin Brown or. Ben, uh, Benjamin Rose and stuff, right? But one of those guys probably put that seal on. Another little thing that we found, um, I can zoom into it in a bit, there's a fingerprint right here. And, uh, sort of a modern day finger, when I say modern day, maybe from the Edmiston shot. This here is actually a thumbprint from the, the, the glass plate photographer developing 
it was kind of a rush job. This photo itself had to have been a rush job. The, the photographers were usually very careful once they coated the glass plate with collodion. And before sticking it in the camera, they would grab the glass plate by the edges and handle it really carefully. But in this rush job, he probably left that thumbprint there later. Right. And another thing, I don't really have it circled on here, but we theorized that since Byerly was a portrait photographer, that that's the lens that he had in his camera. And when the troops came by his building, he just, that's all he had to go. And he had to work quickly because it takes, to, to, to create a picture like this, it, it, it takes 10, 20, 30 minutes to, to get all your liquids and glass plate set up, to get your camera set up. The whole, the whole nine yards. So it takes a very long time, relatively speaking, to take a photo. So he had to act quickly, like, like Paul was saying, and we suspect that he had his portrait lens in the camera as opposed to a landscape lens. And you can, uh, it's a little bit, but you can sort of see the center of, of, of action here uh, is, is more in focus, and then you get a lot of the blurry stuff going on here, which is uh, what we think is, is representative of more of a portrait lens being in the camera. <laughs> Some other things to, of note is these uh, poles here. You can just barely see these poles. Uh, it's holding up an awning, which I'll show you a little bit here in a second. Um, this is a, uh, a piece of lint. It's very hard to see right here. But this piece of lint is very interesting because it is on the original Edmiston photo. This is a photo of a photo. They bought a photocopy. That's where the word came from. This piece of lint is on that photo, which is in uh, Heritage Frederick right now. But we stumbled across another copy of this uh, Rosenstock photo in the Smithsonian Institution. We went down, talked to the archivist, and we got permission, went up the back stairway, and she allowed us to view their copy of this photo. And guess what? It does not have the lint on it. So we know that there's two, copy, there's two photocopies of this photo floating around. The problem, the Smithsonian one, they just sort of had a modern day copy of that. They had a copy of so, a copy of a copy. So we knew that there were two Edmonston copies made in the year 1930. Right. And it's all because of this piece of lint. Um, these, this circle here is showing shutters closed on what you'll uh, learn about the, uh, this is George Murdoch Tyler, we'll get into that in a little bit. But the shutters are closed. The shutters were closed in town quite a bit. And this here, the, as a matter of fact, this whole globule area bothered Paul and I for probably a year. We had no idea what this was. We couldn't figure it out. We thought it might have been some kind of barricade or some construction. Yeah, a new building going up. Couldn't, for a while, we, we thought it was the Fredericktown Savings Institution getting rebuilt because it went through several different iterations of you know, two stories, three stories, and then a marble structure by the early 1900s. So we thought this was maybe the Fredericktown savings institution that was being referenced in a lot of the newspaper articles. <coughs> and this ball was kind of quite interesting. We, we had no clue what that was. It looked like a, We thought it was a window pane, basically. It almost looks like a storm door or something. So, oh, one last thing. Back up a second. We're just going to show you. Okay. Well, this here is very important. This threw me off for a couple of years. I was trying to go out on the curb and take shadow readings on July 9th every year. Thinking, look, I'll take a couple blocks of wood. I'll create this shadow to figure out what time in the morning the photo was taken, or on September 10th. No, what that turned out to be was a bracket underneath here that creates this shadow, a different color piece of wood bracket. So anyway, back now, um, we're looking at the, one of the Union photos um, also, by the way. Let me get this. For some of you have probably already seen this map, but um, this map shows the angle of where the camera operator took the picture. So we're basically looking at the far side of the Market Street here, the east side of Market Street in this photo here, and in this photo too. This photo, by the way, was taken from the steeple in the church. It's, uh, John, you might better help us out with the name of that, the German Reformed Church or something like that. Um, this was taken from that steeple, and incidentally, the trajectory of this photo, this is Byerly's studio right here, and if you look closely, uh, it's like, this little window right here is his skylight. 
So it's, it's just barely visible in the corner. And this is also an 1890s photo on the left. And if you turn on the brightness, you can actually see Byerly's name here. But what I'm getting at is the trajectory of this photo is coincidentally about the same trajectory as, as the Confederate photo was taken. So the staircase here, you can just barely see it right here. See the railing? Mm -hmm. That's the railing for this staircase right there. And that's also. That's also this stuff. So somehow in here there's a staircase. Um, Just off the edge of the photo. Right the there. The photo that's that. missing. And um, yeah, so here <laughs> I, I did a sort of a shoddy job trying to superimpose the staircase from the photo that you just saw onto the uh, Confederate photo to, to show kind of how it fits into the, the city. Now the staircase was a little bit different. Because in 1867, the property was sold, and the new owner, Pope, redid a little bit of the dimensions of the staircase and some of that, so it's not quite exact. This is another interesting thing. Remember, we had, we had this door circle because we didn't know what it was. Well, now we know what it is. It's, a, it's, a, it's an iron railing fence protecting the, the stairway that went down to this door. And, and this bar that we see is actually the top rail. Of a okay. broad iron graveyard type fence. Um, this is a very interesting photo. It's, um, it's hard to see, but this is Rosenstock's store right here. And this is the store next to it. So this store, this building slash store, is the same building that you can see this awning on it, okay? And as a matter of fact, if you look very closely, this photo is taken in the Early 1880s Four, or something. Think, yeah. uh, this guy Berger came on board about 1880. He takes over the spot where Markham was near the end of the Civil War. So he's up top, a new photographer. Yeah. And if you look closely, that spot. look closely at this awning right here. It's a different color. So this this piece of the awning, even though it's 20 years later from when this photo was taken, is this same piece right here. It's the same piece. So they added this on at, at some point after the Civil War. And um, this, it's hard to see, but this little, uh, that's a brick marking in there that says 1860. So we know this building was built before the photo was taken. Uh, and we think that a three-story was put on this the same way that Rosenstock was. Um, now what's interesting about this also is these window slops say Nelson's Demo rooms. Now we know that Nelson first opened up in January 1863. So we do not know if the awning was there in 1862 when the Confederates were in town. It may have been there, it may have not, but it was more likely that the awning only would appear on the July 9th possibility of the photo, 1864. So <laughs> this photo is also a picture of this area as well. Um, it's hard to see, but the alleyway is right here. I didn't really point that out, but in this photo, there's an alleyway right there. And that's the same alleyway right there with um, uh, this building is where the truth out of the two the soldiers are sitting on the steps. And this uh, building is this one here. This was after a 15 minute rain shower, August 15th, 1898. <laughs> this is an interesting photo. Um, it shows, this is one of the clearest shots of the uh, Byerly uh, photography building before <coughs> it fell down before it collapsed. So this is uh, about 1913. 1913. Washington parade photo. Right. And beside it is Rosenstock's building where the, the, uh, the sign is. Um, interestingly enough, you can see it's three stories now. It, you, it was two stories when this, when this photo was taken. So about 1866, Schlesinger has the building rebuilt after it's sold. This, Stern, I think, or Stern had it yeah. yeah, some of you might have seen this before. This is a Harper's Weekly sketch from the 1862 uh, invasion into Frederick. You can see in this area up here is known as Warman's Woods. Uh, Walkersville is out in this area. Uh, we have North, uh, you know, Market Street going up through the middle, and Church Street runs right through here. You can see the, the Confederate troops marching south and turning. If you zoom in, you can see them turning onto Church Street. The Byerly studio, it, it, interestingly enough, this Harper's Weekly sketch was, was very accurately drawn. It's amazing how, how the detail that he put into this. 
we feel that this building right here is the Pyrely Studio. This building is the building that we just saw with the band photo in front of it. But what you can't see is the Rosenstock building because it was only two stories tall, <coughs> right in between there. Um, and if you look closely, you can see some of the awnings that, that we uh, talked about that are right there. So, <clears throat> very, very accurate drawing. Um, going to get into, um, so once we figured out where this photo was taken, it circled all the way back around to what I wanted to do in the beginning. <laughs> Just take a then and now photo, right? <laughs> of course, this is like three years after the fact, because we just didn't have the time to research every single day. But um, So we found out wh where, the, where the photo was taken from, but now we wanted to do a modern day photo of it. Very challenging. A lot of different challenges. Um, one was the height of the of our photo. It was up three stories. The owner of the building wouldn't let us in unless we wanted to rent their apartment or something. I sent them an email trying to be a renter. They didn't go for that. <laughs> <laughs> Once I told them I was just doing a history project. Um, the weather, when I say the weather, I, I mean the, the season. Probably not the right term because we needed, there was a big tree in the front, so we needed the leaves to be off the tree. So we had to take the now photo in the winter, the dead of winter, when it's cold, with all the leaves off so that we could, we could see, you know, it, make it an interesting photo to look at. Traffic was another issue. On Market Street, we needed to go at like 6, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday when there's like no traffic out there. Otherwise, it's blocking all the little fun, fun features that we want to show. So number two, or three, was the people. We wanted, one of the problems is 8 o'clock in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, there's nobody out. We wanted the, the now photo to sort of have some character. We didn't want it to just be like an abandoned street image of Frederick. So we needed people, right? And the only way to get people in it, is, as you'll see, is I, when I stitched together the photos, I actually stitched together eight different photos, which you'll see. And the other issue was the sunlight, which I kind of already mentioned about the weather. It had to be done very early in the morning. So this is uh, one of our first attempts at the now photo. Um, with the yellow lines that you see on there are actually uh, the software I used. That's from the original. Uh, oh, one of the interesting things that we needed to find out was, was the curve the same that it was during the Civil War? We found out that the curve was within inches. Okay. Of where the street was during the Civil War, so that was an easy part. So all these we established that we were lucky. We all these lines you see on street. here are all the different square, uh, you know, 90 degree objects that we could pick out here. You've got the, uh, the cellar doors here. You got the end of the, the two buildings because there's two buildings here. This is one. This is one. So that's that line. Anyway, what we did is superimposed. Um, using software, the, the straight line geometry onto the modern day photo, and that's what we use to uh, sort of help rectify and figure out where, where the uh, photo was taken. This is just an interesting shot that shows the cellar doors. This shot was taken looking backwards towards the Byerly building. Um, kind of a neat shot. Uh, this is some of the, the, I got three photos here. Sorry, I don't have them separated very easily. Um, this is us sort of setting up our computer equipment. We, we um, to, to get accurate measurements, we set a baseline here at the alley and used uh, kids' sidewalk chalk to make uh, uh, you know one foot increments al along the curb line so we could do measurements later. Um, I used a, a laser measurement device to, to help sync all that together. We essentially created like an NFL football field with chalk markings on both sides of the street. Right. So we could have our accurate data. And once we did that, then we could start to draw perpendicular lines across the street um, to sort of sync up where this uh, awning was and, and where the sign kind of implanted itself into the ground. And, and that's how we were able to figure out with, with pretty good precision. I mean, we're fairly certain we know the window that the photo was taken out of, uh, out of the viral studio, as a matter of fact. Because when we move the camera, even if we move the camera just a couple of feet, What we think now is that, in all probability, okay, we're back. Okay. So even if we move the camera a couple of feet, you'd be amazed at what happens to these lines. 
I mean, they just didn't, they, they squished, they didn't all sync up. So we're, we're fairly certain we know exactly which window. And the window, by the way, is, well, the problem is this building's been rebuilt. So we think it's the, the this closest window here in the third, the third story. And, uh, or it's quite possible that because the property that Rosenstock rented, which is on the left, which is now the perfect truffle store, during the war, it was only two stories high. So Byerly had side windows that were later eliminated in 1866. So Eric and I are almost convinced now that the famous photo was taken out of a side window that we can no longer get a photo from because it's now bricked in. And anyway, this is a little bit of how we took the, took the photo. We couldn't snap a picture up here at the end of a 40-foot pole, so we had to have a Wi-Fi computer going here, and then this young lady was very patient waiting to get into her apartment. <laughs> and it was a challenge, because there was a beautiful young woman that we saw going in and out of the apartment a few times, and we thought, how do we pull this off without looking like stalkers? <laughs> or without looking like peeping Tom? So we had to do it very early in the morning, and we would slide the pole up between the bricks, not even in front of the windows, because you can just imagine if you look at the third floor apartment window, and there's some camera waving around, I even tried a drone, by the way. Don't tell anybody about it. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was my nephew's drone, and I, I think I, I wrote it. So, <laughs> hit the building in the tree a couple times. I said, we can't do this. So. But anyway, you can see the challenge with the trees and the leaves being on the trees. Here, um, we, we took the tree out during our, our, our superimposed image for obvious reasons. We wanted just to, you know, the steps where the, uh, these guys are sitting are all covered up. So we took this limb out. It's, it's really there in case you guys want a true representation of the then and now photo. Um, it, oh, incidentally, I, I mentioned earlier, um, I wanted the photo to, to, to have character to it and have action in it because it, it, um, it's 7, 8 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. The street's completely empty. It's like a ghost house. So this superimposed image, which was our final product, actually consisted of eight different photos. To get the cars, I had to wait for a car to come by. Um, these cars were parked. This guy walking, he's in here twice. This per yeah. <laughs> so I've got like all, like eight different photos stitched together to help to create uh, an atmosphere and give it some character of downtown Frederick. Um, anyway, that's um, basically the conclusion. Uh, obviously, our, our stuff is printed in the Battlefield Photographer, and then you guys might know it was also in the, in the Washington Post. John probably did a little uh, column. Now we have a special surprise for you. Eric, yeah. you a little Google Earth demonstration. Yeah, I'm hoping that will come together. He wanted to basically create what Market Street, the buildings, would look mm -hmm. like during the Civil War, which has changed quite a bit from all the modern changing over the years. So with his computer mapping skills, we hope that in the future, he may have something that we could put possibly at the ground floor of the Monocacy National Battlefield Park Headquarters Center, where the kids could play with the mouse and fly like a bird down Market Street. So what we're looking at here, the blue lines are the modern day property um, boundaries of the buildings in, in downtown Frederick today. Um, the, the, the superimposed map that you see in the background is an, actually an, an 1858 map. It, and if you look carefully, you see this empty area, the, the darker, or obviously, building structures. But there's an empty lot right here. And, and this is right where the Rosenstock building was. This is the Byerly building where the photographer was. And this is an empty lot. So we know, because this awning is here, that this empty lot had been built along with the brick date stamp, you might remember that, um, in, in 1860. So this map is fairly accurate for 1858. And incidentally, this, these uh, property boundaries here Prior to Schlesinger <coughs> buying them, this was the old uh, printing office of the Frederick Herald, yeah, 1820, 1830. So yeah. he sold it to Schlesinger, and then Rosenstock's building that he's living in, that he's, you know, the store is in, it was the actually the old editor's uh, building, from the, and the printing press was the building in the rear, uh, you know, the, the store in the rear. So anyway, so here's the cool thing. So what I did is I took, uh, what I'm d doing is taking a lot of the dimensions and the models and the, the, some of the trigonometry and triangulation and all the measurements that we did in the street. And what I'm doing is creating a, um, 
a, a three-dimensional map of the landscape of when that photo was taken. So, for example, I turn on these 3D buildings, and you can zoom in here. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, this is Rosenstock's building with his sign out front, right? The sign's a little bit low at this point, because we both, Derek and I, both realize now that the sign probably hung much taller. And, and here's the awning that we see in the photo. And the Landauer sign would have been, if you have the laser pointer, you can show yeah. where that may have been. So that would have been really tall, up about the right about third here, story window coming off of this end. So in the original Firely building, they had quite a large gap with the building next to it. But when the Firely building is rebuilt in the year 1915, they fill in that alleyway. So there's all these different little idiosyncrasies that are involved. And Eric, looking through all the property deeds, measuring by meets and bounds, he can create what it looked like then. It takes a long time for him to do this, but he hopes to have it completed one day. He hopes to have <laughs> the Wayne Brown Tyler properties on the other side of the street, the George Murdoch Tyler properties on the other end of the street, the savings institution. But it's hard to know exactly who was there at certain times. There was a blacksmith named Lee. That was just south of where the awning is. He was there for a while. So you can see how we can play around with the angles and measurements and all that stuff. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah, we'll conclude the, the talk right now. And if you guys have any questions, we can flip the lights on and we can look at more. Please take some chocolate. <laughs> Big hand for Eric because he basically put everything together in the car. <laughs> I'm not going to do a story, but I don't have the skills to do what he does. This, tonight, what you're seeing is a revolution in Civil War mapping for the future. <coughs> you, you could recreate the town of Gettysburg the way it looked in 1863 and July 1863 when the battle occurred. It'll take a lot of time to create something like this, but it's something that the National Park Service would certainly be interested in. At their battlefield parks like in Antietam or Gettysburg, you may be able to create what the village of Antietam looked like during the Civil War from the time of the battle. So give him a big hand because he's basically <laughs> about creating the fort. There's probably a good future in it. Yes. You Thanks have for coming up. I idea of what the uh, Confederate unit that was. That was Confederate oh, unit. the Confederate unit? Well, I for one have to apologize because I had stated many times to different newspaper reporters, different people, that the photo was most likely taken on July 9, 1864. Now, there's many reasons I came to that conclusion. For one, when the Confederates were in Frederick for one week's time from September 6th through September 12th, 1862, the only two photo galleries in town at that time were owned by both Union men, Byerly and Market. Basically, they could have had a line of soldiers down the block like a good humor truck with all those Confederates <laughs> wanting photos made. It's most likely that Markin and Byerly closed and locked their studio the entire week, most likely, because you have an issue. If they had said, look, we will take your photos, but we'll only accept union money. <laughs> you can't say that to 50,000 guys who are all armed. That would be insulting. <laughs> also, after the fact, they may have had problems with most of their neighbors who, because Frederick was four-fifths union sentiment, you have all that pressure from your neighbors saying, look, you know, why did you do this business with the Confederate? Part of it was also what they felt in their heart. They weren't going to do business with the enemies of the Republic. So part of it is, the question is, is Byerly, for some reason, in his studio on September 10th, when the bulk of Jackson's troops moved south 
down North Market Street. But all the records that we could find show that Jackson's troops that came from Mormon's Woods very early in the morning at twilight, basically, when they're moving through Frederick. And we believe that they took that right-hand turn on Church Street, so they wouldn't have been in the window where the photo was taken. Now, there may have been some troops that may have gone down North Market Street, but what happens is Jackson's guys vacate the west end of Frederick by about 8 a.m. in the morning. At that time, A.P. Hill's guys are coming into Frederick on South Market Street. Then they take a left over on West Patrick Street to head west. So we don't really believe that there would have been troops backed up in front of the window of the photo. Now, one of the other things, if you want to go to this photo here, is that if you could just shut the lights off for a second, and we'll go to the famous Confederate photo. One of the interesting things about it is this dark spot under the sign. Oftentimes, dark spots from Civil War photos on cobblestone streets indicate rain. Now, the last time it rained in September was a thunder shower on September 1st in 1862 before the Confederates get to town. The weather is perfect all the way until September 11th when it starts to drizzle a little bit. So the question is, this photo is not that great quality because it's only a copy made in 1930 with the Edmonston signature. Edmonston has all the time in the world to take a great photo of the original. He can put the original on it easily. So all of the problems with the photo were from the original print being out of focus using a portrait studio lens instead of a landscape lens. So the question is, did this puddle of water indicate the slight rain shower that fell on the night of July 8th and July 9th, 1864? Now, in July 9th, when Early's troops come into town, they spread out like an octopus. They go every direction because they want to find the banks and the depots, the warehouses. They want supplies. They want money. <coughs> Frederick's going to pay because they're a northern sentiment town. And that deals with the ransom money also. So, my best hypothesis, if this is July 9th, 1864, 